I, I, uh, I was sitting up front here and looking down at the front row, and uh, I started thinking about how much our family sacrificed so we can do this work. And I see my two grandkids and my two daughters and my wife, and I realize how much I've been away. And I think one of the things I really want to do right now is to ask us to stand on behalf of all of our families that sacrifice so that those of us who want to do the work of the union can do it, because we couldn't do it if they weren't standing beside us and behind us and supporting us. So please stand on behalf of our families. The other is I, uh, when I asked John DeFazio, because I wasn't sure if Rich would be able to, Rich Fitzgerald would be able to finish his meeting in time to be here, I stepped down and I asked John DeFazio, the president of county council, if he'd come up and say a few words if Rich couldn't make it. And right away he jumped in and said, absolutely no problem. And I started thinking about, then about Jim Robinson, John DeFazio, and, uh, Bob Bratlich, Mickey Bro, those are four directors that have left us. Two retired and two as incumbents didn't win the election. But I want to say to them, because you didn't win the election doesn't mean you didn't do a good job. It actually means... <laughs> it actually means that our democracy was working. And I also wanted to think about the tellers that do the hard work of our union. When Jim talked about starting the election process back in May, they're elected at convention as rank and file leaders in their regions. And they're asked again to sacrifice and leave their families and come and coordinate the election. I don't know how many of them were able to stay. I know they were with us on Friday and Thursday, but some of them had to go back and some of them were worried about weather coming from Canada and live in Pittsburgh, Susan wanted to come to Pittsburgh because she was tired of the snow and it snowed every damn day since she got here. <laughs> so, but I would like if the tellers are in the room to stand and be acknowledged for the hard work and the decent work that they've done. <laughs> and as my, uh, my mentor, Lynn Williams said, we can't give up too early. As Ed Schultz and Rich Fitzgerald and Mayor, the mayor uh, said, and Stephen and Nina, this is our time. We have to stand and be counted now. We've never been under attack like this by a political party, openly, deliberately, saying that they don't want us, as Rich said, on the playing field. And if not us, then they can do whatever they want. And like Ed Schultz, I don't want to be sitting at my lake where I don't catch as many fish as he does at his lake, but I don't want to be sitting in my boat thinking that I failed my kids and grandkids. I don't want to leave this union worse than I found it. And I can't get there. We can't get there. None of us can get there. As that video said, unless we have the membership behind us. And you that are in this room, who sacrificed to get here, some of you lost days work, some of you drove miles and miles, some of you rode buses through snowstorms. You're the front line. You're the ones that give us the power to do the work that we want to do. And it's our obligation to give you the tools that you need to do that. As our logo says, I always love seeing that logo. That logo is helping hands, as Nina said, lifting somebody up when you look at the logo. And when you look behind it, it doesn't say disunity and weakness. It says unity and strength. It gives us the message of what we need to do. We need to be unified. We need to have strong backbones. And we need to believe and transmit to our members and to the communities and to our families and to politicians that hope can overcome fear. 
Hope can overcome fear. And if you watch the other side that's attacking us, misrepresentations, scaring the hell out of people that they think they can scare the hell out of, telling them if you vote for this union, you'll lose your job, telling them that your kid had a pre-existing condition so Travis Turner would have died if we wouldn't have fought for the Affordable Care Act. It's our responsibility. It's our generation that has the obligation to leave this world better than when we came into it. I'm getting ready. Last time I did this, my pants fell down. Those of you that remember this, this time I'm wearing braces. <laughs> We've been trying to rebuild the union. And I want to say this, the four directors that left and those that stayed, we have led this union through its most difficult time. In 2008 and 2009, when America was losing 700,000 jobs a month, can you imagine? 700,000 jobs a month. We stood up. We stood up and said that wasn't acceptable. We stood up and supported the president in a bill that would bring jobs back to the country. Every Republican but one voted no. And when that one Republican Ireland inspector voted yes, they ran him out of the party. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. We were losing. This union was losing the equivalent of 100,000 members in one year as a result of the economic collapse. We didn't cry. We didn't hunker down and say it's all over. Our executive board took and made the tough decisions. We sacrificed the resources. We gave up our pay increases. We should have done that. We were proud to do that. We took the kind of things that we needed to take to the membership to strengthen our strike and defense fund so we could stand up. You remember what the cry was? Stand up, fight back. And I said it in a different way. Stand up, fight back. We're not taking this shit anymore. So we've been rebuilding our union. We've been restructuring our union. We want it so that it gives people a chance to participate. We recognize that we can't win a fight on the picket line at Neville Chemical if we're just walking up and down to the plant at Neville, Chem Neville Chemical. We're going to go after the shareholders. We're going to go after the board of directors. We're going to go after their customers. We're going to make them the sorriest bastard they ever were that they decided to take us on and try to steal our members' pensions. But we started to globalize our union. We started over 10 years ago, building strategic alliances, working with other unions in other countries. Some of the alliances aren't formal, they're just informal. We share our information and ideas. Some are formal. We have a formal relationship with the Mexican mining and metal workers. We're close to doing a merger. I don't think I'm telling secrets out of school. We might end up merging with the Mexican Mining and Metal Workers Union. We'll have a union that represents the southern tip of Mexico all the way to the North Pole. <laughs> but we're going to do that smart. We're not going to do it in a foolish way. I'm proud, and uh, Jim made a terrific introduction of Juan Linares, but I want to fill in a blank. Juan Linares was arrested coming off an airplane from a health and safety conference in Western Canada when he got to Mexico. They dragged him and put him in jail. And for two years and the number of days that Jim read out, he never was charged with a crime. And we mounted a global fight to get him out of jail. And we got him out of jail. And one of the things, don't clap yet, one of the things that he said, <laughs> one of the things that he said when he was in jail, think about this, ask yourself if you've got this backbone. Ask yourself if you've got this courage. Ask yourself if you could sacrifice this for your family. He spent more than two years in jail. They offered him millions of dollars if he would tell lies about his union. And if he would tell lies about his union, they'd give him those millions of dollars and they would move him to another country if he saw fit to start a brand new life as a multimillionaire. You know what he said? You can't buy what my friends can give me or what my union does for me. That's Juan Linares. Stand up, Juan.
standing beside one, Franz Bellini. Franz is the head of the National Union of Mine Workers in South Africa. Franz is in a fight where the companies have created a, what they call a yellow union. We call it scabs. The companies created a yellow union going into their mines and their workplaces trying to divide their members, shooting and killing and stabbing and taking on their members, trying to destroy their union. He didn't back down. He stood up. And his union is working. And we have an alliance with the South African Miners Union. And an injury to one of them is an injury to us. And we're going to stand and fight and make sure that the Miners Union in South Africa get the justice they deserve. So we've been globalizing our union. We have strategic alliance with the CNM Coot in Brazil. Our people go there. We sit at their bargaining table. They come and sit at ours. We have alliances with the Australian Workers Union and the CFMEU, which is the Mining and Metal Workers Union of Australia. And again, we work together with the Maritime Union. Steve Hunt, who's sitting up here, works on the Maritime Marine so that if a ship leaves with scab material on it, we can track that ship and we'll be there when it lands at the dock. Not sure what'll happen, but we'll be there. <laughs> we have an alliance with IG Mattel, the largest union in Europe largest metal workers union. We ex have exchanges. Our people go there, their people come here. We're learning how to work within each other's framework. We're going to try to do some things through the negotiations that are going on on an agreement with Europe and, and America. We created a brand new union called Workers Uniting, which is a function of Unite the Union in Great Britain and the United Steelworkers. We're now sanctioned and made legal in four countries, Great Britain, Ireland, Canada, USA. And, and And in a couple of weeks, we'll be having our executive committee of Workers Uniting. And we develop strategy together. We work together. John Geenan, who's sitting here, and Gary Beavers, who's sitting here, sits at their bargaining table in the same companies we have. They come to our bargaining table and sit at the same companies we have. And our message to them is, we're united. We're united. Unity and strength for workers. It's not just a slogan. It's got to be the mission. Because if we don't make that the mission, They'll try to pick us off one at a time. And if they pick us off one at a time, which one of us will be last? What's that old saying? We ought to all hang together, or we'll all hang separately? I ain't in favor of hanging. <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> so we've built those things to globalize our union. Are we there yet? No. We're working with, with IF Mattel from Sweden, and I don't know if... Uh, my friend got over what happened between Sweden and Canada, but we'll still be able to work together. <laughs> and then we've tried to do the same thing internally. We're trying to do the same thing internally, and the reason for that, discussions with Lynn Williams and George Becker, and we start to think about, as we were coming up in the union, there was very limited opportunity to be involved. You had to be on the grievance committee, or you had to be on the bargaining committee, or maybe the safety committee, and there was limited opportunity. Well, we've now built a new structure that gives tremendous opportunity for people to participate. We've got SOAR, the Steelworker Organization of Active Retirees, and we want to keep our retirees active in our union. We want to keep them active so they're fighting for the same kind of social justice issues that we fight for. And I think they had their executive board meeting here in town, I think maybe yesterday, and there's a bunch of SOAR uh, folks from the SOAR uh, National Council that they've got. Every district in the union is represented by seniors, and we have seniors basically almost like seniors locals all over North America. So I would like any of the members from SOAR to be in the room to stand up and be recognized. We created a Women of Steel movement. You heard Stephen Lewis talk about the way that started. I'm really quite proud of that, and, they, and Jim uh, mentioned it. Uh, Stephen played a role in creating the Women of Steel program. People don't know that. I was the Ontario director, and we didn't have any opportunity for women to be involved in our union, and uh, didn't know how to get started. So Stephen's brother, Michael Lewis, volunteered for it. So the first chair of Women of Steel was actually a guy. <laughs> and, 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 and Michael, through Stephen, figured out that we could get some money from what was then called the Ontario Women's Directorate. And we got a grant of $75,000 to build a women's leadership development course. And we did that. And we had two or three rounds of those development courses and they were held in the district office and 
Finally, I guess they voted that a couple of the women ought to come to my office and give me what for. And they came to the office and said, uh, who picked this name? I did. You know, we don't like it. Oh, well, why don't you pick a name? I didn't have the guts to pick another one. <laughs> so I said, why don't you pick another one? They went back in the room, they came back and said, we want to be called the Women of Steel. The Women of Steel now is a network in our union of over 4,000 women, and when they have their international or national conference, they get over 1,200 participants, and it's one of the most exciting conferences our union, because those women come, they love our union, they want to get to work, and they want to be involved, and we need more of them in leadership positions. We created the next generation at the last convention. We've now got a network in every district where we've got young people who are playing a role in developing the programs that we need to attract more young people. If you look up at this, you know. <laughs> I gotta work with these folks, I'm not gonna say how ugly they are, but I'm gonna tell you there's a lot of them with more gray hair than me. You know? We're not the future. Let's be honest with ourselves. We're not the future. We're the present. That next generation is the future. We need to find the way for them and the women of steel and others to get involved in our union and work their way to the top. So someday at some point, there may be a young woman standing where I'm standing, or there may be a young person of color standing where I'm standing. We need to be a reflection of our society. We develop local union leadership courses. We have a four-year leadership program that people come in and they get opportunity to train as leaders and become leaders in our union. We've got a rapid response program that has thousands of people. We had a conference in, 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 in little country I'm in, in uh, Washington. I think we had about 900 people at that conference. All people who are politically active, knowing how to motivate people in their workplace on issues that affect them and their families. We created an institute for global and human rights. When you see the buildings collapsing in Bangladesh, see the fires in Bangladesh, you see those workers that are demanding to have a union in Bangladesh? Guess who that is? That's the Institute for Global and Human Rights that lives in our building that we help create, that fights every day, and they're there on our behalf fighting for those people. I don't know if he's in the room. Is Ramogi Huma in the room? Ramogi here somewhere? In the overflow room, is Tim Waters in the room? Tim is one of those guys that stays up till two in the morning so he can't get his ass out of bed till 10 in the, in the you know. But he's probably in the other room. But let me tell you about Ramogi Huma and what we've done. Some of you may have read it. We've been working for now close to 10 years, Tom. We've been working for close to 10 years with, with something that was called the Collegiate, Collegiate Athletes Association. And it was a network to try to bring kids that play big time football and basketball who generate billions, not millions, but billions of dollars for the NCAA. And people don't know what their circumstances are like. They get scholarships that are only one year. If they get injured, they lose their scholarship. And if they lose their scholarship, they lose any potential health care. They're somewhere between 18 and 21 years of age. They, don't, they, have to, they have to play or practice between 40 and 60 hours a week, plus go to school. If they miss practice, they might lose their scholarship. If they have a voluntary practice, as it's called, and they don't send medical attention and they get hurt, they get no medical attention. And the rule with the NCAA is if you're having practice, you've got to have medical attention. So they don't call it a practice, they call it a voluntary show up. But if you don't show up, you don't play. If you don't play, you lose your scholarship. Okay, so we've been building this organization for a long time. Ramogi signed up 17,000 people. Okay. No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. 17,000 people. A month ago, we formed a union. Collegiate Athletes Players Association. We got all the players. Um, we have to be careful because we need a couple that are, need protection. We signed everybody up but one or two from Northwestern University. And we applied to the National Labor Relations Board 
for the new organization, new union, called the Collegiate Athletes Players Association. We're now going to have a court case because it's going to determine whether these college kids who are getting screwed every day. Only, on, only, I mean, think about this. Only a little bit over 50% ever graduate from big time college football and basketball. They're left stranded often with injuries that will be with them for the rest of their life, but they have no health care. And up till not long ago, if they had a pre existing condition, they couldn't get any health care. So, sometime in the next short while, the National Labor Relations Board is going to determine whether the collegiate athletes from Northwestern University are in fact employees, and if they are, they have the right to form a union. And they will now have a voice at the table. And I know what's going to happen. I won't be here when this gets done. Because if we win, they're going to appeal to the courts. And if we win in that first court, they're going to appeal to a higher court. And if we win in that higher court, they're going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And hopefully by the time we get to the Supreme Court, a lot of those right-wing bastards will be gone. You know? And then we'll win. But I couldn't help, and I don't read from things very often when I'm doing a speech, but I want to read this. This happened the day after we applied. We did this in a hotel in Chicago. Perhaps future college athletes will pass this place. Plaza Ballroom B at the Hyatt Regency, 151 Wacker Drive. I don't know why they call it that in Chicago, but anyhow. <laughs> Someday when they're walking alone along the Chicago River, they won't think of the step to step inside to appreciate the beige walls or the floor to ceiling windows or the carpet with its patterned squares of ovals and ovals. Yet this room has a good chance of becoming an important part of history because the players' movement to unionize, which follows Tuesday's creation of the Collegiate Athletes Players Association, is only going to strengthen as more athletes from around the country step forward to embrace the cause. It's only going to gain momentum as groups such as the NFL Players Association and their support and their support to a mission that has already got the public and the powerful organized backing of the United Steelworkers. You know? It's like a number of the speakers said earlier. Some things are a moral obligation, right? This is a moral obligation. When you sign a kid up, and you tell him that you're going to give an education, and he gets hurt or she gets hurt, and they're pushed to the sideline, and then they don't get education, and they don't get a good future. Who's going to stand by them? They've been getting away with this shit for 75 years. And what I said to Ramogi not long ago, someday, this will open up the debate of the Wagner Act, of determining what is an employee. Because remember, when we want to organize the definition of an employee under the Wagner Act, automatically takes 60% of the population out of the ability to organize because they're not defined as employees. So when we win this case, that will open up the whole definition of what an employee is. And that will kick open the ability to organize in all other sectors. And what I can tell you this, after hearing Ed and the anger we share in our gut about what happened in Chattanooga, not only did a federal senator step out of line, but a governor stepped out of line, a Republican governor, a Republican member of the State House stepped out of line. And if they think by threatening workers with losing their jobs, from a political perch is going to scare us out of the South, I can tell you that when this board sits down shortly to look at our organizing program, we're not going to double our efforts in the South. We're going to triple and quadruple our efforts in the South. They ain't running us off. We created the Blue Green Alliance with my friend Dave Foster. We created the Blue Green Alliance so that we could stop the debate. And I grew up in Sudbury. 
I don't know how many of you know about Sudbury. When I was a kid, the astronauts went to practice landing on the moon there because there was no vegetation. I thought I was a hot shot in track, but I didn't realize you could run track without sucking in sulfur fumes till I was 20 years old. And I can remember our company telling us, look it, it's either good jobs or a clean environment. You gotta make a choice, kid. It's not a choice of a good job or a clean environment. For my granddaughter and my grandson, it's gonna be both or neither, and I know it, then they know it, and we need to make sure that's what happens. We're gonna have a clean environment and we're gonna have good jobs. How many of you know about A. Philip Randolph? Raise your hand. Pretty small crew. I can do this in an African-American crowd and only a few more hands go up. A. Philip Randolph was an organizing pioneer. He organized the sleeping car pourers before cell phones and those fancy things that Ed held up. I don't even know if they had damn telephones then. And he organized the sleeping car porters into a union. And the sleeping car porters were primarily all black. And he opened the door just like we're trying to do with these collegiate athletes. When he organized that, we knew those that were there that we could organize everywhere. And right now in Pittsburgh, and I'm so pleased that Rich and Mayor Peduto are here and John DeFazio because they've been instrumental in supporting this. Our union runs a program in the Hill District called Breaking the Chains of Poverty. We're not gonna collect dues for this. We're doing it because it's morally right. In the Hill District, running a program called Breaking the Chains of Poverty, we bring young men and women into a training program for six or eight weeks, and we train them on work skills and life skills, and we drug test them, and we do all those things. And when they finished and passed the program, we go looking for jobs for them. And right now we've trained 125 people and 62% of them have jobs that pay more than the minimum wage. We do that because it's morally right. A lot of those kids are the kind of kids that Rich talked about that when they see that there's no future here, they go to what's next on the other corner and they need a hand. They need to get help, and we're there. When we think about what's going on in the country now, in the US and Canada, in Canada we're running a program called Stop the Killing. We started in 1992 after a disaster in the Canadian mines in a town called Westray, where 26 miners were left killed in the mine while they were trying to organize a union into our union. And we fought for them and their families for 10 years. And we passed the Westray Bill, it was called, that meant on its face, if an employer was negligent in occupational health and safety, and someone got killed, they would be subject to criminal charges and might do time in jail. Since 2002, when that act was passed, there hasn't been one person go to jail, and there's been min minimal convictions. We're not gonna stand by and let them ignore the law. So we're now in a national program being led by our district director, Steve Hunt, and our national director, Ken Newman, going all across Canada meeting with police associations, meeting with city councils, and educating them on what the Westray Bill says, and telling them that if there's a fatality in your town and you ignore this law, then you're gonna pay a price. Because workers deserve to know that when there's an accident, everybody's gonna stand up for them, not just a few people, but everybody. We're doing that. <laughs> we're doing that and we're getting ready to mount a campaign. I said to Stephen Lewis and, and, and to, to others today when we were talking, the one thing I've learned being in the US now almost 20 years and going back and forth to Canada, anything bad that's going on in the US, you can predict that six months from now some right-wing nut job in Canada is gonna bring it forward. 
And we have our share of right-wing nut jobs in Canada, not just here. And right now we've got a prime minister that is going to look at defunding. What we, what we have is uh, public financing of elections in Canada, so you don't have the, the money pit here. He's looking at defunding that. He's looking at bringing forward legislation that would again, like here, strip public sector rights to collective bargaining. We have a potential provincial election in Ontario where the head of the Conservative Party, uh, in fact, I gotta back up. Stephen Harper, uh, most Americans wouldn't know him. Uh, we often talk about the Tea Party and the tea baggers here in the US. Stephen Harper was the head of the Reform Party in Canada more than 15 years ago, and the Reform Party was the forerunner of the Tea Party. So these right-wing bastards, they talk to each other every day. <coughs> they collude with each other every day. So when you hear an American talk about the Tea Party, then you gotta remember that the Canadians are dealing with the equivalent of that. When you hear the Canadians talking about the Reform Party, you need to know that the Americans are dealing with the equivalent of that. Then you come to the province of Ontario, we're in the province of Ontario, we've now got a conservative <coughs> who is not much different than Walker. In Wisconsin, he's actively running on a program to bring right to work and paycheck deception to Ontario. When I left Ontario, Ontario had card check. When I left, on, and left Canada, Canada had card check. When I left Canada, Quebec had anti-scab legislation in Quebec. You got a union when you signed up 50 plus one automatically. You were recognized. All that's under attack. So the right wing is floating north and south and we need to challenge that. Then when you come to America, look at what's happened. Look how we fall into their trap. We've had almost three years of continuous job growth in the manufacturing sector. If you listen to the right wing, nothing's been done. But if you look at what's been done, none of it was done with the support of the right wing. When the president tried to get a jobs bill through, they killed it. When the president tried to get an infrastructure bill, they killed it. When the president tried to get a higher minimum wage, they won't bring it to a vote. When the president wants to bring immigration reform so we take the people and bring them out of the, the shadows. How many people actually think about immigration, immigration reform? Do you know that these employers, they bring people in that are undocumented, they put them in their workplace, and if we go try to organize them, they pay them next to nothing, and if we go try to organize them, they come in and say, I'm gonna get you deported. We've experienced it in places where we've tried to organize. In fact, they fired 91 of our people at a place we were organizing who were all undocumented, they're scared to death. I can tell you what, I think I'm a survivor. If I lived on the southern side of the Rio Grande, and I was expected to raise my family with four and five dollars a day wages, and I saw that if I could get on the other side of that Rio Grande, I could get eight or ten dollars an hour, which is a pittance to us, but if you're on that other side living in a cardboard shack in a Maquila zone, working for Ford or working for IBM, or working for General Electric, and you're making $5 a day, you put me on the other side of that river, and I'm getting to the $10 job. You can't build a wall high enough, you can't put a fence big enough, and if I have to swim around the goddamn thing, I will. That's what's wrong right now. These workers just want to eat like we do. And what we were told by NAFTA is that we'd have rising tide for all boats. What we've had since NAFTA is a rising tide for the yacht owners and a sinking rubber dinghy for the rest of us. And the only way we're going to change that is to confront it. And I'm going to tell you something that I've come to this conclusion 
Maybe I had come to this conclusion over a year ago and I didn't, maybe didn't have the guts to say it as openly as I should have. But I've started to say it more often now. When I look at all the things that this president has tried to do and all the things that he's been stopped from doing, when I look at Mitch McConnell who brings forward a piece of legislation as the minority leader in the Senate, brings forward a piece of legislation thinking that Harry Reid doesn't have the guts to bring it up for a vote and when Harry Reid says, okay, we're going to vote it, Mitch McConnell filibusters his own bill. What a stupid bastard that is. <laughs> when every jobs bill that they bring forward, every job bill the Democrats and the President bring forward, they stop. When they say that the most important thing, don't forget Mitch McConnell said his most important thing was to make sure that President Obama only had one term. That means that Mitch McConnell's already a failure because President Obama's had two terms. <laughs> Let me tell you what I think the problem is with the right-wing extremist Republicans. What the problem is, is they can't stand that there's a black man in the White House and they don't ever want it to happen again and they can kiss my ass. He was the best man for the job. He's still the best man for the job and we're not going to let them run him out of office. We should make no illusions about that. We should have no illusions about that, because what it tells you is what Ed Schultz just said a while ago. It shows you the level that they will stoop to, the level of fundamental dishonesty that they'll have, the level that they will say, we'll do anything to stop a union because we want to keep your wages low. We want to attract jobs to Mississippi and Louisiana and Texas on low wages. You can't raise your family on no wages. I mean, you want to have a minimum wage of $10 an hour, God love you. You can't raise your family on $10 an hour even if you've got two goddamn jobs. What are we doing about it? If not us, then who? We say we're a fighting union, and we are. And we don't have a shortage of fights to pick, do we? But if we don't fight, what will happen? And I say this quite often. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Imagine your future if you had no union. Imagine your future if they succeed in creating a low-wage economy. Do you know that kids coming out of university in the United States collectively have over a trillion dollars of student debt? <coughs> Elizabeth Warren said, they keep telling us that education is the most important thing you can have. If education is the most important thing you can have, then her argument is you should then give kids the loan at the same rate that the Federal Reserve gives the banks. I got lots on my mind. And uh, sometimes I maybe take it out of my wife and kids because I get a little cranky. But I can tell you, they give it back better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> if you are in this union, or in any union, and you wake up in the morning, and you think everything's okay, quit. Because we don't need you. If you're in this union and you wake up in the morning and you think about the way things are and they make you a little angry and you think about the most recent thing that you've paid attention to as it applies to middle class standard of life, as it applies to having health care, as it applies to be able to think about retiring with some dignity and some decency, when you can think about not having to spend your dying days cutting pills in half. When you think about wanting to make sure that your kids and grandkids had a better shot in life than you did and that they can earn their living. When you think about all those things and your gut starts to tighten up a little bit 
and you start to stutter a little bit because you're so pissed off, then you figure out where that energy is going. Because when you start getting angry, you're generating energy. And if you can generate that energy by doing what Nina Turner said, be a little extraordinary, do a little bit more, stand up, fight back, know that there's more of us than there are them, know that if we can get our people involved and that if they participate, we can beat the big money. We can beat the secret money because what we have that they don't have is a direct connection to the people. And we need to use that. We need to bring a union together that brings everybody in it. We need to look at our logo and see the helping hand. We need to look at the cut line below Unity and strength for workers, not disunity. I think of John DeFazio yesterday at the board meeting. Whole life in the labor movement. Jim Robinson, a whole life in the labor movement. They didn't win the election. They didn't threaten their union with, I'm going to take you to the labor board. What they said is that we accept the results of the tellers and I want to help the new director in his transition. That's real unionism. <laughs> so I want to say to you, your union is strong. Your union. Not my union. Not the union of these people up on the board. You elected us. Without you, we're nothing. But don't elect us and leave us stranded. Don't put us in these positions and not show up when we need you. When you go to a union education, whether it's in the leadership development, whether it's staff training, whether it's health and safety, whether it's rapid response, whether it's women of steel, whether it's all that stuff I talked about, if you go there and you're on members' dues, you don't own that knowledge. That knowledge belongs to the members. You have an obligation to share it. And I don't want to insult anybody. Certainly, if there's anybody here that's a dentist, I don't want to insult you because I'm going to say something about that in a minute. <laughs> when you're rich, rich Trump commanded. Whether your membership have chosen you to be the shop steward, or whether they've chosen you to be the health and safety rep, or they've chosen you for any office, including the presidency of this great union. <laughs> There's no greater honor. And because they've chosen you, and because you have a union, every morning that you wake up, you have a chance to make someone's life better. Even if it's just giving them a shoulder to talk on. Even if it's just giving them voice because they don't have the courage to use their own voice. Think about how important that is giving someone who doesn't feel the confidence to speak out, to trust you to speak out on their behalf. I believe fundamentally, short of possibly a religious calling, there can be no greater calling on earth than being chosen to speak on behalf of your fellow brothers and sisters in their workplace and in your community and your society. Think about how great that is as opposed to waking up every morning as a dentist and looking into somebody's mouth with bad breath. Not a want to insult any dentists. In fact, when you look in my mouth, I know you make a lot of money. <laughs> but that's it, sisters and brothers. That's what we are. And I'm terribly humbled by you and by our board to be able to be your president. But every one of us up here needs you. When today's over, tomorrow starts. And tomorrow without you means there's no tomorrow for others. So when we call on you, be there. As Nina said, do the extraordinary. And then someday, we'll all be in our rocking chairs, 
or at Ed's Lodge catching the big fish that he pretends he catches. <laughs> and we'll know that our time on this planet made the planet better and made the lives of the next generation better. Solidarity forever. Stand up, fight back. Together we're stronger.